Hello everyone, hope you're all going well. Uh, today in our close scene analysis, we're gonna be looking at the final moments of Rear Window, the conclusion of the film. So as we get closer to our Rear Window sack, I think it's important to know what Hitchcock's intentions were at the end of the film and which loose ends he decides to tie up. So the conclusion gives us a chance to be a little bit reflective, a chance for us to, to assess who has changed and to what degree they have changed. Well, that final montage, as we get an update of what's going on in each of the apartments, it definitely gives us a chance to, um, to look at what Hitchcock's views and values regarding marriage are, or at least we can make some educated assumptions. But without further ado, um, let's watch the final scene of Rear Window. I hope it's going to be a hit. This is the first release. I'd love to hear it. I can't tell you what this music has meant to me. So there's only a minute 30 in that particular scene, but there is a great deal of detail to unpack, which we'll be doing in this lesson. Uh, but before we, get it, we, before we get into that, I think you all know where this scene fits, um, but I kind of thought it's important to kind of point out that the climax, the moment of most tension in the, the film is definitely the previous scene. Okay, so the scene where we see Jeffrey's leave his apartment, that he, kind of enters into the, the world, which has been his viewing experience for, um, for an extended period of time. This is the moment where he does seem to find meaning attempt for the first time in his life. Um, the final scene, the one we're looking at today, is very much about tying up the loose ends. Okay, it's not a, it's not a climax in the dramatic sense. It's very much a, um, a denouement, which we're gonna look at the, the next scene. It's very much about um, putting all the pieces together. Okay, so the first shot of this, this scene is a close-up of the thermometer. And of course, this isn't the first time we've seen the thermometer. At the start of the film, the thermometer is used to highlight that there's oppressive heat in the community and there's also lots of, lots of tensions as well because of it. Okay, so in the opening scene, the thermometer is at 94 degrees, which is um, a sticking hot 35 compared to the closing scene, which is 71 degrees, a mild 20 degree Melbourne day. Okay, so, so this is the first of many nods to the start of the, the film and the denouement. And I mean, a nice, nice little word or phrase that you can use to maybe showcase the mirroring, the, sim the symmetry that Hitchcock uses in the film is, um, referring to these moments as recalls. Okay, so these are small, innocuous little moments. They're not crucial to the plot, but it's, Hitchcock definitely gets some sort of pleasure of giving us a 
peculiar sense of familiar fulfillment, um, a bit of a frill, and a bit of a callback to earlier moments in the film. Okay, it's almost like you're going full circle. Um, but essentially, this first close up, it's about showing us the heat wave has passed, along with all the, mo the moral crises of the film, crises of the film. But as we pan further across the courtyard, we see the characters of Miss Lonely Hearts and the composer. Okay, so we get a little snippet of indistinct dialogue from them with Miss Lonely Hearts saying, I can't tell you what this music is meant to me. So this is obviously referring to the moment the music saved her from contemplating suicide. Okay, we know in that shot, that long distance shot, we also see the parallel with Lisa that she's also distracted from the music um, as she's in Fallwood's apartment. We, later, we do later learn the song is called Lisa, so maybe that's a little bit self-absorbed on her part. Um, but we also see that the composer's kind of turned his life around. He seems to be over his midlife crisis. He's in a relationship now, and he's hoping that this, this tune, Lisa, is gonna be his next big hit. Okay, so potentially he's over his, his angry, alcoholic ways, and he's maybe destined for some career success. Okay, so this is, this particular shot does seem to validate the idea that we, we need connections, we need relationships in order to have meaning, in order to be happy. Um, just to look at the lyrics of the song Lisa from Rear Window in a little bit more detail. Um, I put the lyrics there at the side, which you can which you can read yourself. But this is very much the theme of Rear Window. It's constantly in the background, and it comes to represent the changes, um, the changes that we see from start to finish. Okay, so the start of the film is very much a tentative sort of piano, gradual instrumentation, um, before it metamorphosizes into this. Pow, powerful triumphant tune by the end of the film. Okay, so like Hitchcock does use, like to use a lot of mirroring his film, this does mirror the progress of Lisa's relationship with Jeff. Okay, but potentially as it also touches Miss Lonely Hearts in this community of isolation, perhaps music does provide a connection between um, all of the residents in the community. Okay, so maybe it's one little thing that they can all hang on to. As we work our way further across the courtyard, we see signs of change, we see signs of new life. So interestingly, interestingly the, the color of Four Wards apartment is similar green to, to Miss Lonely Heart's typical attire, to Lisa's green suit. That's now being painted over, suggesting that but now there's gonna be a new member to the community. Are they gonna be welcomed with open arms or are people just gonna to return to their um, old ways of life of looking inward rather than outward? And we also see a bit of a return to routine um, with the couple on the second floor. Okay, they've got a new puppy and the basket routine is uh, coming into place once more. Um, we then come to see um, an update on Miss Torso's situation. Okay, her, so her husband's returned from the army and to our great shock and surprise, he's not one of those rich, wealthy suitors um, that have been chasing Lisa for much of the film. He's a short, chubby man with glasses who she seems to meet with genuine enthusiasm. Okay, so it seems just like Jeff, we have kind of misjudged her as a character. Okay, that she's not necessarily the, the single free-spirited woman that she was painted to be. And we see that Miss Torso is someone who's constantly eating throughout the film. She's constantly hungry as if she is searching for more. Um, and we see that even her husband upon, her ret upon his return makes the quote, the army's made me hungry. Okay, so this quote just I guess got me to reflect on I guess, is it the absence from his, from his wife 
um, has made him so hungry that he's been longing for that connection. But it could also be a comment of maybe, is he going to be satisfied in a post-war life? Okay, we know Jeffrey definitely struggled to adjust. Is Miss Torso's husband going to be able to reacclimatize? Uh, moving on, we then see um, the image of the sculptress. So she's the one character throughout the film. He does not appear to be looking for love or in a relationship, but we know that she seems quite content, quite comfortable sleeping in her little hammock chair. Okay, so, so maybe Hitchcock is suggesting that there are alternative ways to happiness than your traditional heterosexual relationship. Um, another little small detail, we also notice the bird, which with the birds on Miss Horse's rooftop, the birds in the cage, which is symbolic of freedom, where this cage used to be back inside the house, it has seemed to maybe obtained a little bit more freedom by reclaiming its spot on the ledge. And if we keep moving on, uh, we have the newlyweds. Okay, so they were our great white hope at the start of the film. They seem to be the only functional relationship, um, the only happy relationship. But by the end of the film, the honeymoon period is well and truly over. Okay, we, again, we get this indistinct dialogue. If you told me you're, you quit your job, we wouldn't have gotten married. Okay, they're clearly having financial issues and it looks like Hitchcock, Hitchcock is trying to paint some ambiguity on the future of all the relationships in the cool yard, okay, including Jeff and Lisa. So with this in mind, I think this is a good chance for you to maybe reflect on what Hitchcock's views on marriage are. Okay, so when we're referring to views and values within our text response essays, it's really good to use these strong active verbs to frame your discussion. So along with this presentation, there's going to be a worksheet where you can write just a short answer response, maybe looking at what you think Hitchcock believes, what does he suggest, does he celebrate or condemn certain aspects of marriage. Okay, so whether you stop the video and do that now or do it all at the end, um, that's up to you. All right, so we've got an update on the neighbours. Now we get an update on how Jeff is traveling. So we, first of all, we kind of fly through Jeffrey's window into his apartment and we see that he's, he's asleep, he's content. He's like the sculptress. He's got this smug smile on his face, which is very different to the sweating, uncomfortable man we see at the start of the film. Okay, and most significantly, okay, he's no longer facing the window. He's no longer, no longer bored. He's no longer needing to do something drastic. It seems like he no longer needs to be voyeuristic in order to be content. Um, it is important to pick up on though, that compared to the start of the film where we had the one broken leg, he now has two. Okay, so I think this is kind of a retribution for Jeff. It's a bit of a consequence. He's not getting off completely scot-free for maybe his peeping Tom behavior. So Hitchcock is suggesting that, um, that Jeff had maybe crossed the line and he's not completely without blame. But ultimately I would suggest that through his face, through his demeanor, it seems like his contentment suggests that perhaps the ends do justify the means. Okay, so that even though he might have crossed the line, even though he's got his two broken legs, um, at least he's in a happier position in his life than he was at the start of the film. So just another little activity for you to do now. So I just want you to look at the impact that each of the following areas have had on Jeffries. Okay, so we do see quite a bit of transformation from, from Jeffries. Um, and as I said, I will just give you a bit of time to complete this um, after you watch the rest of this recording. 
Okay, so we've had a look at what Jeffrey's um, final position is. Um, now we are we kind of panned across the room to, to Lisa. So interestingly, interestingly, we kind of cut straight from um, Jeffrey's legs and we actually move across to Lisa's legs. So it's, it seems like Hitchcock is making some sort of comparison between the two here. So my reading of this is that maybe she will continue to be she'll continue to be Jeff's legs. Okay, so so just like Stella and her were the ones that kind of carried the investigation, just as though Jeff was reliant on them to to do his bidding, to cook for him, to to give him massages at the start of the film. I think it's suggesting that um, Lisa will continue to be the dominant one in the relationship. Um, maybe don't use this phrase in your essay, but she will continue to kind of wear the pants in the relationship. But the big question of this final this final moment, and it's it's definitely open to interpretation, and you might hold a different view, is the question: Is Lisa play acting, or is she playing against expectations? Okay, my my reading of the ending is she's decided she's not going to conform to his wishes to make him happy. Okay, so she does swap between the book of Beyond the High Himalayas back to her bizarre magazine. And to me, this is her reasserting her true self. Okay, she's the magazine wasn't hidden, it wasn't completely tucked away, um, hiding in a corner of the room. So I think Jeff even probably understands that she's not going to fully surrender to his whims. Okay, they might be able to find a greater level of compromise. Um, but I don't think Lisa is the type of person who's fully going to go away from her true identity. Another reason that I kind of have this view is because of the, the triumphant song of Lisa in the background. To me, this very much makes it a contention that she has succeeded in her job in winning over Jeff. And perhaps she can now return to her usual life this time just with Jeff on her arm as well. Okay, and we do see in this final scene that again, Jeffries is the passive one. He's the one who's asleep. And the film actually concludes with Lisa watching Jeff while he's asleep. So to me, this is reiterating the gaze that the idea that gaze is power. And as I've said, that perhaps Lisa continues to have power over Jeff. Um, in this relationship. Okay, that's my reading. But again, if you, you can definitely use evidence to support a, um, a different argument. All right, just quickly, I'm not sure if this is in the original video. So I'm just going to show you the very final moments of the credits of the film. Okay, so just a very small detail, um, but it's important to know, I guess, just as at the start of the film, we saw the blinds raise up. As the film closes, so too do the blinds of Jeffrey's apartment. Okay, so Jeffrey's life of being a voyeur seems to have at least temporarily ceased. Now he has Lisa in his life now that he's content. Um, and so too has our um, cinematic experience. But I kind of want to pay attention to the music in the background here. So we see Franz Waxman's comical non-diegetic music. Okay, it's the only non-diegetic music we see apart from the very opening credits as well. Um, and the fact that it is so comical, that it is so lighthearted, to me this does downplay the violent act of Miss Forward's death. Okay, that's predominantly the key plot line. Um, but to me, this, this comical musical of the end, music of the end is suggesting this isn't primarily a film about murder. That's not, that was the story telling device that Hitchcock used to drive the plot, but that wasn't the main focus. So instead, I think it is suggesting that Hitchcock's main attention all along was for us as an audience to enjoy a, voyeur, a voyeuristic watching experience similar to that of Jeffrey's. Okay, so Part of us maybe has the guilty pleasure of prying into these private lives 
um, where we know that we shouldn't be watching. Okay, so to me that comical music at the end reinforces that idea. All right, so just to conclude this lesson, um, just one just kind of question to pose to you. And as I said, this will probably enable you to reflect in your own position of the film's ending. So the question, Lisa has assumed a position of power over Jeff by the film's end, um, do you agree? So just like we've been doing cover flash writing, make sure you draw on specific moments in the scene, um, Hitchcock's aphorial choices, and make sure you embed your quote seamlessly into your discussion. All right, so that's all from me. So I think it would be worthwhile that you Zoom with your teachers to go over some of these um, ideas. And as I said, make sure you do complete the worksheet that is attached to this PowerPoint and really reflect on where you stand in the film's ending. Okay, you, you're probably not gonna have time in your essays to be I don't know, dilly-dallying dilly, dilly and um, maybe reflecting on all the possibilities of the ending in the film. Okay, it's probably good if you have a maybe a stance on what you believe Hitchcock's intention is at the end. So hopefully you found that useful. Um, and yeah, good luck for the upcoming sack. All right, thanks guys.